1987, four childhood friends were reunited after 10 years to investigate the murder of a mentor they all shared. During this time, they unlocked the deep secrets of the past and found themselves exposed to the darkness that surrounded them. Soon it became more than a fight for justice, and instead it became a fight against the ultimate evil. Six months later, in the winter of 1988, bonded by their knowledge of the dark unknown, they have decided to no longer be the victim. Now they seek out the deep roots of satanic corruption that hides in the shadows of society, all the while trying to mentor a new companion, seeking justice for the death of his cousin. Institutionalized is the second story arc in the Chronicles of Darkness first edition story, The Ultimate Evil, set in Bismarck, North Dakota in 1988. Join us in this tale of satanic horror with Wayne, played by Adam, Che, played by Andrew, Alex, played by Mitch, Michael, played by Slavic, and the newcomer Derek, played by Tillman. If you'd like to contact us, you can find us on Twitter at twin underscore cities underscore VTM and on Facebook and Discord at Twin Cities by Night. If you'd like to help support the podcast, you can find us on Patreon at Twin Cities by Night. We hope you enjoy. Warning, the following podcast contains violent scenes that may be unsettling to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. In 1987, four childhood friends were reunited after 10 years to investigate the murder of a mentor they all shared. During this time, they unlocked the deep secrets of the past and found themselves exposed to the darkness that surrounded them. Soon it became more than a fight for justice, and instead it became a fight against the ultimate evil. Six months later, in the winter of 1988, bonded by their knowledge of the dark unknown, they have decided to no longer be the victim. Now they seek out the deep roots of satanic corruption that hides in the shadows of society, all the while trying to mentor a new companion seeking justice for the death of his cousin. Institutionalized is the second story arc in the Chronicles of Darkness first edition story, The Ultimate Evil, set in Bismarck, North Dakota in 1988. Join us in this tale of satanic horror with Wayne, played by Adam, Che, played by Andrew, Alex, played by Mitch. Michael, played by Slavic, and the newcomer Derek, played by Tillman. If you'd like to contact us, you can find us on Twitter at twin underscore cities underscore VTM, and on Facebook and Discord at Twin Cities by Night. If you'd like to help support the podcast, you can find us on Patreon at Twin Cities by Night. We hope you enjoy. Wayne and Alex, you both step out into the hallway outside of Otis's apartment. You're again welcomed with the dirty orangish carpet with the brown plastic baseboards and the white paint that's slowly turning yellow from cigarette smoke and age. You guys just got done speaking with Otis about his grandson, Toby, and you saw the desperation but you all, that he has in wanting to find Toby, but you also saw just how much of a burden Toby was to him. Not in a, not that he would ever say it, not that he would ever complain about it, but knowing that a man in his 60s, in his mid-60s, was having to raise a boy who has lost his parents, you guys could see it was taking its toll on him. But he still cared. He still was driven. He still had that fire to find out what has happened to his grandson. After all that, what is going on in your mind right now, Wayne, after you have spoken to him? Wayne definitely feels kind of saddened by his, from what he heard from the old man. It kind of makes him think about himself as a young man, giving his dad all kinds of hell, you know, and, and just the, the disconnect that he had with his father and just like, maybe uh, his parents did the, the best they could for him. Maybe they were just kind of thrown into a situation like, like this guy here. And, you know, they just like, weren't really like equipped to, handle it properly or, or something like that. And Wayne just feels like a little sense of guilt and he'll kind of uh, take like a look around in the hallway and he'll just be to Alex. He'll say anything else you want to check out while we're still here. 
he's just kind of trying to um, remove himself from that that situation he just had with the old man. Alex will take a deep breath and he'll uh, sort of look at the carpet, rub his boot into it a little bit, run a finger along one of the walls, maybe peel off a chip of paint. No, I think I'm good for right now. This place uh, kind of bothers me a little. Yeah, let's get out of here. So you guys walk down the steps and you can actually feel the the salt from the sidewalks outside as it rubs into this carpet, as it grinds underneath the soles of your boots. And you push that glass door that was in that little lobby that had the dirty tile on the floor that had those mailboxes, those copper colored mailboxes that were nailed to the wall. And you push that door outside and you step out on the sidewalk and immediately you're hit with the brisk coldness of outside. You, you feel your nose hairs start to freeze within your nose. And you see right away the plume of breath come out from your mouth as the warm confines of that apartment are no longer there wrapping itself around you. And you rush to your car and your car starts up on the first try, still warm from 30 minutes ago when you stopped in this parking lot. Blue Oyster Cult continues to play in the background. What are you doing right now, Wayne and Alex? Wayne is kind of doing that thing where you wait for it to heat up a little bit before you actually start driving. So uh, the car will kick on and he'll kind of like wait to to put the heater on and he'll just be like rubbing his hands together and stuff, maybe going for a cigarette and just he'll say, what do you make of that man's story? As Wayne goes for the cigarette, Alex is going to give it a nice long look. Just it's so tempting, but he's got to keep to his new rules. He'll uh, rub his hands together sort of stick him in his pockets and squeeze into his uh, coat as much as he can. I, uh, you know, I'm still working my way through it all. The guidance counselor thing is really interesting to me. I don't know why. What, what's what's it about this kid's teacher that he likes so much? I don't know. Maybe they connected. Sounds weird if you ask me. I, I definitely want to talk to the guy. All right, let's do it. Should we call the guys? Yeah, we should probably give him an update. Why don't we just head back there? All right, let's head back. Yeah, Wayne is just going to kind of pull out of the uh, out of the apartment complex slowly, you know, mindfully, still kind of watching everything as he leaves, taking in the the sights and just remembering the last time he was there as well. Yeah, what is I mean, I, I want to ask both of you guys some questions, but w- one with you especially. You said this dredges up a feeling of guilt because of what this kid is putting his parents through, but I mean, in any way does it like hit you at all that this kid had went through a lot though, like experienced a lot of loss at a very early age and everything. I mean, does that still make you feel guilty what you put your parents through? Was that because you feel that this kid has like more of a reason to be the way he is than you had a reason for being the way you were or. Yeah, pretty much. Um, Wayne is kind of just like, I mean, he, he immediately recognizes that this kid's situation is obviously a lot worse than his was. And, you know, Wayne, even was telling the old man, oh, it's just, it's, it's really normal for, for kids to just, you know, act this way towards the, towards the people that take care of them. Like he probably just ran away. Oh, it's probably fine. But it does make Wayne think about just, you know, himself being in like a camp, like, you know, getting in all kinds of trouble as like a little kid and just like already starting to create that like disconnect between him and his dad and just like stuff like that. But it's not really, I, he doesn't really see it as the same thing, but it's just, it's causing him to think, you know, it's causing him to like, remember just like, you know, weird parental relationships and stuff like that. And it just like makes him uncomfortable for a second, you know? For sure. And how, how does hearing though, during that, you mentioned that you heard about the close relationship that he had with his Mr. McNulty, his guidance counselor at the school. And uh, for the record also that Otis gave you guys like a little index contact card that are in Rolodexes where he wrote down the guy's phone number and his name. Does it bring Wayne any comfort to know that Toby had a friend in this Jason Matthews kid who he felt that he could find in, you know, because he said one thing that Otis said was that like Toby wasn't really good at making friends, but he only, you know, that Jason kid was like the only real friend he had. What, how does that make you feel to at least hear that this kid had like one here in a way? Wayne finds it somewhat interesting that he is like bonding with an adult because Wayne himself and the others in the group kind of did the same thing like bonded with an adult when they were at a period of their life where they were kind of like lost so but it's like that's like the thing that he kind of finds like the most interesting he's not really that interested in 
the idea that he would like run away to his friend's house. Like that sounds kind of normal to him, but it is like interesting and somewhat relatable to Wayne that he would, you know, he wouldn't go back to the school unless he could talk to this one adult. And it's like, why, what is it about this one adult that like he trusts and like he rejects his, his other authority figures and stuff like that. Like Wayne kind of relates to that because, you know, he, he trusted Amanda. He kind of like looked up to her and stuff like that in a way that he really didn't with other adults, I would say. So this is layers of similarities between you and him or you, your friends and him, the, the adult mentor, the kind of not ha- having a hard time getting along with authority figure, parental figure. And then almost in the same way being shipped away. And mind you, you weren't shipped away to like a school, but you were definitely sent to a YMCA summer camp because your parents were like thinking that you needed that structure during the summer. They're afraid what kind of trouble you get into if you were didn't have it. So yeah, there's a lot of similarities between you and Toby and your pals and Toby when you guys were kids. Alex, I wanted to dive into one thing. You said you said something that kind of piqued my interest. You said you didn't want to have a cigarette because it didn't follow the new rules. Tell me what what are these new rules that you're speaking of? Alex is trying to clean himself up, you know, with having beaten his heroin addiction he's really trying to stay as clean as possible you know he doesn't drink as much anymore if at all he stopped smoking he started running again in fact that uh running is his athletic specialty you know he spent so many years running away from everything now he's actually using it to run to towards something instead of running away from his problems he's trying to run towards a goal what's that goal like you said you're running towards something what's that goal revenge Against who? By like who? Who are you getting revenge against? Against what? Like what? what does he know yet, or is it just like, is it he, that anger that he's feeling that he just feels like he has to move forward towards something? It's that anger. He's not yet really decided on a specific target for his revenge, besides anything that resembles what happened with Welkstetter. So you just want answers in a way too, right? You're you're searching for answers. You're consumed with it. Oh yeah. How does that dream that you had though this morning make you feel or this last night when you woke up like like does that just fuel you more does that scare you or like does it does it strengthen your resolve or does it make you question what you're doing It's very disorienting um it strengthens his resolve though because he knows that there's a piece of that whole episode still in him and he's very angry about that because that piece that episode is what set him down the miserable path he was on for so many years Does he feel stronger now? He does. It's stronger and weaker. He feels stronger because he knows he's getting better, but he feels weaker because before where he was not really looking at or paying attention to his issues, now he's really scrutinizing them and trying to be aware. And that makes him a little more cognizant of the difficulties he faces and the particular personal weaknesses that put him in the position he was in. So the Alex of now... Is completely 180 different than the Alex after the Neepy Sweat Lodge, where he was just kind of mentally broken at that point and just like didn't and was drinking and wanted to pass out and forget everything that happened. Yep. Alex is now very, very angry. And that anger is fueling a lot of things. But it's not affecting your relationships at this point. Not with the people that have been there for him. He's not angry with them. He's actually very grateful for them because they have been there, they have supported him, they have helped him along the way. He's angry with the things that have put him or that put him in the position he was in, even though he's not entirely sure what those things are. So the apartment, then what did that apartment do to you just right now? Because you mentioned that you seem kind of lost when you're looking at the apartment and you kind of peeled some of that paint off and you're looking at the carpet. What did that dredge up in you? Memories of the earlier buildings that his parents lived in and possibly owned when he was younger, when he was a kid. The story involving the guidance counselor, you know, brought back memories of Amanda, no doubt the kid connecting to him and having that stronger relationship, even if there is an element of oddity to it. I mean, there's an element of oddity in everything in your life now. Yeah. At this point. Yeah. Damn. Satan. Okay. You guys are in this car and blue oyster calls burning for you is playing in the background. As you guys get on divide street heading West and then you go off onto main street going South or you head on to state street going South towards main street. And you slowly make a left onto Main Street. We'll cut to Derek, Michael, and Che. Derek and Michael, you guys are sitting inside. You both see Che outside in the front having a cigarette. He just stepped out a couple minutes ago, right after he told you welcome to the team, Derek. 
you're still sitting there in your work clothes from the metal shop. And you just kind of opened yourself up to these two about what you feel right now, about why you're there, about the impact of Amanda's death. And you see Mike sit behind the desk. He has that black dress shirt with the wild, colorful shapes all across it with his stonewashed jeans on. In front of him, there's a notepad where he was writing down notes in a folder. Michael, you know that in about a half hour, you're going to have Miss Samantha Buckley coming in. Che actually dropped off a folder at the beginning of the morning with pictures he took of her husband, Charles Buckley. Samantha Buckley actually hired Dakota Investigative Services to confirm her suspicions that she had of her husband was having an affair. It was actually kind of an easy case. It's not really, those are kind of the easier ones for you guys to handle. Usually it requires Che to follow him around, get some pictures because these guys are sloppy. They become complacent. It's almost like the power goes to their head. They become sloppy. And Che got these pictures of this man, Charles Buckley, owns Buckley Shoes, which is like a competitor with Payless in the area. And he was been having an affair with this woman who's a waitress about 10 years his junior, which put her probably in her younger 20s. And there's pictures of them going into this hotel and they're like leaving multiple times throughout the week. Go ahead. Scenes on you, Derek and Michael. Oh, yeah, Derek. So we're going to actually have a client come in in like 30 minutes. Uh, pretty clear cut case, you know, uh, cheating husband. Suspicious wife. Eh, puts food on the table for us, mostly. You know? I guess. Yeah. So, did you, like, stalk the husband? I mean, yeah, sort of. Something like that. You know? You follow his movements. And honestly, Che could tell it to you better. You know? He's he's good at this sort of stuff. And that's why he does it. But the important thing is how you actually talk to the client about it. You yeah, of course. Act, you want to make sure that, you know, they're comfortable, blah, blah, blah. But you, you can't, like, really protract it because otherwise, you know, they, they'll start feeling antsy and, well, you know, they'll, they'll know what's happening before you actually say it. But until you say it, there'll be a sort of pressure in the room. Anyway, that's my experience anyway. And you actually have, like, in this office, there's those four desks And then there's like that Coke machine, the coffee machine that's to the immediate right when you step in. But like about like seven feet behind the last two desks, actually seven feet behind Mike's desk, you see there's like a door that leads to the back. Like a lot of these shops on Main Street have doors that lead to the back alleyway. But in that little entrance, there's a couch there. It's almost like a couch that was set up. So if Mike feels he needs to like or someone needs to pull someone back there and sit him on the couch and kind of be like, you know, have a heart to heart with them or something like that. Like they can separate themselves so they don't feel so exposed in this area where there could be multiple people in there, you know? And there's also like, there's kind of like a little end table there that has like a box of Kleenex and stuff like that. And how does that make you feel, Derek, when you're actually kind of realizing right now that these people are exposed to people's raw nerves and and sensitive, delicate subjects such as adultery and things like that? Yeah, he... He definitely now realizes the kind of dirty work, like it can get uncomfortable real quick. Not just, you know, you're hunting the bad guy, but you are starting to see um, like these broken relationships and all the misfortunes in life. And it's definitely like a depressing outlook, like you're trying to do good and (laughs) you're making money of it, which sounds great in concept, but it's kind of weird and messy at the same time also i think uh derek feels kind of out of place right now and he's not sure how to deal with the situation coming up with the client coming in still in his work clothes sink or swim right i mean in the last just today you've been walloped with this sense of like like you said being exposed to people's pain and emotions and when you're thinking that you look outside and you see the grayness you see the back of che as he's smoking a cigarette and see plumes of smoke come while he exhales and he just kind of realizes like the cold brisk bitterness that is out there and it just kind of just puts a nice layer on top of the feelings that you're feeling right now you can't escape what you're what this uncomfortable feeling because out there's death out there's the frozen tundra of north dakota and there's not it's not like in the spring and summer where you can look and you can see people walking down the street or see the sun out or kind of see kids playing right now you just realize that your options are to be in this room with its generated heat where you're going to be exposed to pain and you're going to be exposed to seeing people's hidden secrets or being out there how does that make you feel when you when you think about that i think like derek gets uh, up again and just 
paces the room a little bit, maybe walks up to the heater and like stretches out his hands. I mean, he just walked in, right? Like maybe oh, a yeah. couple of minutes ago. Yeah, like five minutes ago. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so he just tries to get his uh, body warmed up a little bit, just paces the room a little bit, tries to relax now that the things with work seem to be settled for now and just looks about. Mike, what are you doing in preparation for your customer to coming in? Well, Mike has like all the papers prepared, all the paperwork, you know, he probably has already some hot water prepared for some tea or coffee, you know, and some biscuits and probably tissues there as well, just because, you know, uh, kind of expects it. Yeah. And you're sitting there, you see while you're warming up your hands, Derek, you see like Michael getting up and he's kind of like getting everything prepared and straightened it away. Che, your cigarette is finished at this moment. You kind of get down to the butt. What are you doing now that the cigarette is done? He'll uh, he'll come back inside. He's uh, he was just you know taking a that short little break and giving them a chance to talk. He doesn't want to like he doesn't want to like be too like pushy or overwhelm him or anything like that. So like that that whole interaction went outside break. Come back in just to see where they're at, what they're talking about. You see Michael squaring stuff away and you see Derek warming up his hands uh michael you see che walking in go ahead scenes on you guys che you gonna be with us with the client unless you've got something else not really no but i don't i kind of don't want to crowd her <sighs> are you going to be over there and Derek points to the like couch room yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i guess so uh you know what che why don't you take Derek and show him how it's done and I'll just be here. I really don't want there to be too many people around her because she might freak. Okay. I mean, she oh. doesn't know me, right? It's true. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't think it matters. Let's just go and prepare the room. So you three are all in there while Michael starts preparing the room. And as you guys are talking, you see a Toyota Corolla pull up alongside the road. It parks behind the Jeep of Chase. It's newer. It's a black one. And you see the exhaust stop when the car is turned off. And you see the door open and you see a lady get out. She is about five foot eleven, slender. She has long dark hair that comes out the back of this almost like a beanie cap, like a winter cap she's wearing on top of her head. You see she has this navy blue zip up jacket, a thick fleece jacket on, and she's wearing some black female dress slacks looks like she might have some boots on underneath like some dress black boots on underneath it you see that she has this skin that's a very very light caramel color almost like she may be italian a couple generations removed you see that she slowly like walks over the curb of the sidewalk not to step her foot into some slush that's in there you see the plume of breath coming out as she rushes kind of as briskly as she can making sure not to slide, even though there's sand and salt that's on the sidewalk in front of the business. And then she opens the door and you hear the ding ding of the, or the bell ringing, the little bell that hangs off. That's more of a rattle. I'm sorry. And she stops for a second and she does a customary stomping of her shoes that a lot of people do in this area to ensure they don't bring in the suit and the elements from outside. And she sees, she looks around and she sees you, Derek, sitting at a desk there looking kind of not sure what to do. And she's looking at, she looks at Che. Coffee? Yes, please. Yes, yes. And she's like, I have a, I have a one o'clock appointment. I'm sorry. I'm about 20 minutes early, but I have a tendency to be early. It's a bad habit, I guess. And she just kind of smiles warmly at you. Uh, Two sugars, please. Yes, ma'am. And she just kind of stands there and you see she, uh, and she takes off her jacket. She unzips her blue fleece jacket and she takes off and she, she takes the hat off and kind of puts it on the hook of the coat rack that's there by the door. See, she has like this turtleneck tan sweater that's pretty thick on. And she just kind of takes her the string of her purse and kind of like grasps onto it with both hands. You can kind of get the sense that she's a little apprehensive of what's going to happen. And she's like, she takes the cup of coffee from you and she thanks you. And she kind of just nods to you. And she's like, I'm sorry, this is my first time. And she just smiles and she's like, I'm not sure what I do right now. No, just gesture like, why don't you have a seat? And she goes and she sits on. You're, you are you gesturing to like one of the desks, like a chair in front of the desks, or to the couch? Um. Well, I mean, he was getting a whole area ready, so I assume there. 
Okay. You may, and she just, that's more casual, right? Like it's kind of just, you know, relax, sit back just to make somebody feel comfortable. <laughs> exactly. And she's like, Oh, thank you. And she goes and she sits on the couch and puts her, takes her purse off her shoulder and puts it next to her and starts sipping the coffee. So, uh, I'll, uh, I'll just uh, take a seat like across from her somewhere, you know, where like I can uh, just observe her body language and everything and just uh, and I'll uh, I'll say to her, my name is Chayton Thompson. Nice to meet you. I'm, I'm Samantha Buckley. All right, Samantha. Why don't you start? Well, I guess I want to know, is he fucking cheating on me or am I just losing my damn mind? Can I have a cigarette in here? Do you mind if I smoke in here? I'll look at... Uh, I don't, I don't remember if we established a rule. I went outside on purpose because... Uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone's fine with it during this time. Oh, yeah. yeah you, have no. a, have a, you have a nice crystal ashtray that, you know, you can pull out. You know, Mike, you've learned that some people don't like smoking, some do. So you're ready for when they smoke. So you can just like, oh, hey, look at what I got here. I got this nice ashtray. Here you go. You know, and she pulls out the cigarette. You know those old snap cigarette cases that, that ladies used to have? And she has like a pack of 100s in there. And she pulls out a Virginia Slim and she lights it just kind of like shrug when she asks and just yeah then she does that and he slides over the i imagine there's like a little coffee table or something Mm -hmm. yeah oh yeah yeah, there's a coffee table in front of it set the uh ashtray down and just wait for her to continue i i I think that he is i just need confirmation and you see she just kind of like when she says i need confirmation you see her neck and her head goes back a little bit you know like she's like it's almost like someone saying, yep, I'm ready for the shot when they're a kid, even though you know they're deeply afraid, but she's trying to feign strength right now. And she takes a drag, a long drag, and she's like, let's just get this done with. Did you find out or not? Please just tell me. Well, I, uh, I followed him, and it's going to be hard for you, okay? Oh, God. You know, I, I caught him with another woman. Oh, my God. You see her, her hand just with the cigarette just kind of, she puts her face into it. You no. See, I took some photographs if you want to see them, but uh, if you don't, that's fine too. But uh, we have the proof you want. And you see, you just hear the breathing from her. She's just like, puts her face out of her hands and you see her eyes are a little watery. She's like, let me see the pictures. Okay. So I'll get up and go over to where uh, I guess that the, the pictures like Michael has them somewhere since I handed them off to him before. Yeah. yeah, you yeah. Know? And Michael would bring her the tissues. Okay. Thank so like you. over to his desk, wherever he's put them and retrieve those for her. She takes a Kleenex and she kind of dabs under her eyes. Do you notice that she has like this very beautiful complexion of skin? Like she's not wearing a lot of makeup and she just kind of dabs it. And she's like, and she just takes the folder, takes a deep breath, opens it and looks down at the folder. And there's this uncomfortable Derek. You're watching from like the desks and you kind of see Mike's kind of hovering like five feet away, but you see Che's very, warm with her close to her but not in a, in a respectful distance you know and you just kind of see slowly she's looking at one picture and then another and then another she puts the folder down she sits back and takes a drag of her cigarette what do i do now hmm? I suppose that's up to you i need you all to give me a wits and empathy roll please tell me how many successes you got all three of you i want to spend willpower on this awesome holy shit free successes very nice I had none. Damn. What about you, Michael? I have one. Okay. So, Che, you're just looking at her, and you're kind of, like, honest with her. You're like, I don't know, ma'am. It's up to you. And you're sincere when you say that, you know? And it's really kind of hard for, you to, hard for you to make the case. And, Mike, you're kind of the same way. But, Derek, you're observing this from an outside perspective. And maybe it's everything you experienced today. Maybe it was seeing your coworker getting laid off and seeing the emotional output that he shared in front of you. But when you see her say that, you realize, you see her jaw clenching and you're like, oh no, like, like you don't think, oh no, like something bad is going to happen, but you're like, oh, she's about to like let loose here. You know, I'm going to give you an option to do something before you feel like she's going to have an emotional outburst. Do you choose to do anything beforehand, Derek? Mm, Just give me a moment. Go ahead and think about it. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying she's uh, going to have a break it on of sorts yeah she's gonna yeah. get emotional mm-hmm. you can yeah. see it just like your buddy did your coworker. i want to call him a buddy did in the car you know just some traumatic happened and he's about you know you see when she asked that question let me rephrase it when she asked so what do i do now you don't you see that she didn't ask that expecting an answer that's going to lead her a certain direction you see she said that because she's about to let loose verbally with how she feels 
where these two kind of are seeing how, like, oh, she's maybe asking us sincerely our honest opinion, our professional opinion, and we can't tell her, you know? Yeah, like, this is not a situation to, like, give legal advice, like, blah, blah, blah. You could go to the lawyer and blah, blah, move exactly. to your parents, blah, blah. Yeah. Her is... So I think uh, Derek is, like, seeing the change, but he he's not going to stop her. Um, he's not going to interrupt her. I think he would just maybe quietly uh, close the blinds or the door so she feels more comfortable in the room, and, like, secluded a little bit. I like that. I like that a lot. And you see that Mike and Che, as she says that you see Derek slowly get up and he goes to the front and he kind of like closes the blinds. And then she looks towards you, Derek, and you just see the smile, like a, a, a gentle kind of smile. And she looks back and then that serious comes. And she's like, what am I supposed to fucking do now? Hmm? Am I supposed to go on welfare now? Am I supposed to think his, his, his fucking, this asshole can afford to, to pay half his paycheck for me and my kids to be able to survive? Or do I go back and do what my mom says and go back and work on my marriage and make it to where he doesn't sleep with another woman? My mom says this is my fault. My mom says that I'm not doing something right at home. Do I become like my fucking mom and I sit there knowing that my husband's going around fucking around on me and the only reason I'm not is because I need security and I need someone to take care of me and I can't take care of my fucking self? I can't look at my kids in the face with any sense of pride. I can't look at them because I'm ashamed because I know I'm willing to sacrifice what I know is right because I'm afraid to be out on my own? Is this what I do now? Is I do what every fucking person in this fucking shithole fucking town does and pretend that everything's fucking all right? Or do I go, do I leave my kids with this asshole knowing that he probably won't take care of them? Do I go get revenge? Do I go fuck the first guy that I find going to fucking Mandan and finds a piece of shit and fuck him and get revenge? What do I do? What do I fucking do now? Do I go, do I go beat that woman's beat her up in the parking lot of the shit whole fucking diner she works in i don't know what to do right now now i got the answers and i don't think i even wanted these answers i think in the back of my head i knew i couldn't eat, deal with these answers i couldn't do anything with these fucking answers i don't know i don't know what to do now but i do know i got to get my kids in two hours from school and i know one of them has a dentist appointment and then i know i got to go cook that asshole dinner and he's probably fucking that bitch right now in some fucking hotel and i know if i hey. can Chase's going to speak up at this point. He's going to say, ma'am, you got kids. You got to hold out for them. Whatever it is, do what is best for them. Whatever you're feeling, I know it's rough, but you have to do what's right for them. And do you really think it's right for them to have an influence like that in their life? And do I need to make any kind of like social role or anything? Like, uh... Yeah, let's have you roll a, a presence and empathy roll, please. Let me use willpower on this one, too. All right. Three successes. Okay, so you, you for a moment, you're, here, you're hearing her. Before you say it, you kind of move your face in like three inches, just three inches closer. You're, you, you learned in these last, throughout life, and you learned in these last four months, the concept of personal space. Everyone has a different perimeter of it. Some people don't mind being close. Some people don't like it when people are close. And you have found this keen ability to be able to navigate that, those waters. And when you were first speaking to her, you were at the, what you felt was the respectable personal space to give her these answers. And now you know she's seeking more. And you simply, you just leaning in your face three inches more. And you look at her in the eyes and you speak to her from your heart. Because I feel that you are sincere when you say this. Am I correct in that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is like his uh, his ideal of um, he, his 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 virtue is fortitude in that he is the type who sees that you can tough out any negative situation. You can survive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about uh, being strong for everyone else. And in reality, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah, for sure. And you see this moment, you have this moment of connection with her and you realize the way she looks at you in your eyes. There's an acceptance of what you said that you answered that question. That in her head, she had these different pathways of a decision that she had to make. And she didn't like the results of any of them. And she felt lost. Like someone who didn't have a map who was dropped off in the middle of a wilderness and had no terrain to associate. She had no beacon, no north star, no compass, no map, no way to go forward. And she felt helpless. And at that moment, you gave her that way forward. Your information and your advice was the true north star that helped her find her path ahead. And you see, when you said that, she came to an acceptance of what she's going to do. And you see, there's this moment 
where she looks at you, she takes a drag of her cigarette, and she puts that cigarette out before it's even done in the ashtray. And you've seen that same simple little gesture by your pals, not but six months prior when you were at the main bar and you decide you're going to go to New Rockford and talk to Calvin Welkstetter. When you all put out your fucking cigarette and said, when we're sober tomorrow morning, we're going to get in this fucking, in your Jeep, we're going to drive there and we're going to get fucking answers. And you saw that determination and strength that she took it out on that fucking cigarette, that Virginia Slim, she just mashes that motherfucker in the ashtray and she sits up straight and she looks at you and she smiles and she says, thank you, sir. Thank you. And she gets up and you see when she gets up, she has this posture, this strength, almost like a granite stance. And she walks over to the coat rack and she goes and puts on her jacket and she puts her purse around her shoulder and she turns around to walk out and then she stops for a second. And you see she turns and Derek, you're by the blinds when you see her turn around and you're like, oh shit. Because you know, like you thought it was done and she unsnaps her purse and she pulls out this checkbook and she takes a pen and she hit the click click of the pen and she looks at you, Che, and she's like, who do I write this out to? I'm drawing a blank on the company name, but that, <laughs> Dakota, I would, that's what I would tell her. <laughs> Dakota Investigative Services. That's right. And she writes it out, and then you see her writing, and she tears it, the three pull of the check that everyone used to be familiar with, and she leaves it on the table. And she's like, thank you, gentlemen. I'll be recommending you, friends, if they ever need anyone like you. And she turns around and opens the door, and you hear the jingling of the bell. As she walks down the sidewalk and gets in the Corolla, she starts it up. You kind of pull the shades back open Derek and you see the car pull off then you see this Oldsmobile take its place pull its place and you see this long hair guy with the mustache and a ponytail and you can hear through the glass blue oyster call burning for you kind of jamming out so you see this car pull off Che what's going on in your mind right now after that happened that went smoother than it could have yeah like that could have been a lot worse so he was uh he's he's just glad that that was a relatively easy one and for sure for sure. I think that you showed a determination. You were you didn't sugarcoat it, but you weren't like an asshole about it, I don't think at all, you know? I think a no. lot of people I mean, feel, he was just trying to convey to her the idea of like just being strong for her kids with that last uh statement, you know, just like look, just do what's right for them and if do you really believe it's right for them to be around him? You know? Do you do you feel that your advice in a way was tied to your own childhood and what you wish you would have had from your own mother? You know, I didn't think that deep about it. Hmm. I was just going off of like his own personal, uh, his own personal uh, way of looking at the world and that he's, he's feels like he needs to be the one who's the tough guy for everybody. And uh, he was trying to convey that same kind of thing to her because he would think, you know, that's what you got to do for your kids. And it worked, right? It really worked. I mean, it could have easily have not worked. (laughs) (laughs) Three successes worked, right? (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Awesome, man. Awesome. Now, what do you think, Michael, after seeing how Che handled this and even seeing how like Derek's like little step of like closing the shades when he kind of saw that it was getting a little personal? Oh, yeah. I mean, Michael's happy with both of them. You know, they really handled it well. Well, what's your thoughts on everything that happened, though, like with her situation, like what finding out and how she decided well, to deal with it? With you being I a mean, child of a single mother, what's your opinion on yeah. it? You know, I mean, you know, I think at this point we've already had enough of these cases to sort of almost see it as routine. Is that because is that is that because Michael knows right now there might be a lead into finding some information out about Welkstetter, or is that because like this Toby case just happened that he's kind I of think feeling- uh, partially it has to do with. After a certain while, just you sort of internalize of what the work you're doing is about, right? Yeah. And this is just basically part of the job, you know? It's sort of how you get when people who are, for example, on like drug help hotlines and stuff, and they burn out after a couple of months. And when they they get asked why, it's like, you have all these different people, you know, they have tragic backstories, but after a certain while, you see patterns in it and similarities. And it's basically different people, but the same thing over and over and over and over again. So you're at the stage right now where it's just part of the business, but you're not burnt out right now. No, not burnt out, but it's just like, yeah, this is this is how it sort of is sometimes. Mike has automated it in his brain in a way that has like accepted where definitely with Che, it was more of an empathetic, like he wanted to give advice to be more like him and be tough where you, you is really, is this, is this 
the channeled Mike? Is this the channeled anger? Like just how, like, you know what I mean? Mike, it, it's. Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, I think Mike's really motivated when it comes to like the hunt mm, part of this. Yeah. But not the results, not the end result. Like the this. results. Yeah. That's because the hunt's different, right? Uh, you always have different circumstances, you know, you have to figure some, uh, things out and, uh, you just have many different solutions that you can do. You know, you can always improve it or somehow, but the ending, the ending's always like the same. It's boring. It's the end result. Always yeah. the same. It's North Dakota. It's Bismarck. What about you, Derek? As she walks out and you have this, the, you see this car pull up. What's going on in your head after witnessing that? Was it as bad as he thought? Did he learn anything? I think uh, Derek is kind of surprised with himself for reading the situation correctly, because uh, I would think that's something he's very like self-conscious about. Not necessarily bad, but he feels he's not that good at it. So uh, I would say he thinks that went rather well for him. Like it wasn't a complete disaster. Um, the lady got what she. <laughs> What she, what she was kind of looking for. She not only got what she was looking for, but she got advice. What, how did exactly. Make... She wasn't just looking for pictures. Like She was looking for a way out. How do you she feel... basically had made up her mind uh, that her husband was sh- cheating on her before she even went to, the, went to uh, call up the services of Michael and Che and the rest. So seeing the way that Che handled it there... And knowing Chase history with Amanda, knowing the impact that Amanda had in your life, do you see a little bit of how Amanda, uh, how Che handled it, like kind of giving her like honest advice like that? Do you see a little bit of Amanda from that? How does that make you feel knowing that these people were really close to someone who was also impactful in your life? Yeah, I would say um, the stern but like solid advice from Che is definitely ringing a bell. Uh, it's like a call to action, and I would say that that's definitely. Amanda right there. How does that make you feel knowing that these are the same people, the man who did this call to action is also with these others trying to, and in their own way, get to the bottom of what happened to Amanda. Yeah. I I think that that feels right. Like things are falling into place and (laughs) yeah, your face (laughs) says enough, right? Is that like the look that that's how, for those of you can't see Tillman's face, it's more like a, Oh, Hey, <laughs> like this is working out how it's supposed to. We're in, we're, we're in reality. This day has been pretty shitty for Derek. You know what I mean? And now he's having a moment where like, Oh fuck, like this, is this where I'm supposed to be? And it's a, like a really warm feeling. I'm sure, you know, knowing that there's an acceptance that you're in this place and that these people accept you. And when you have that moment, the door opens up and you see Wayne and Alex coming, stepping through, go ahead. Scenes on you guys. Was that just, and I'm like, kind of taking note of the car leaving as like I as I come through the door. Was that just did you guys just tell her? Yep. Yeah, Che did a good job. And then I noticed Derek and I'm just like, hey, Derek. And like Wayne is just like instantly kind of happy that he's there. Uh Wayne was kind of trying to push Derek towards towards the uh towards the group, I guess. Early yeah, on. Derek definitely recalls your face, especially. <laughs> so Wayne would probably grab a seat on the couch, and uh, he kind of like takes his jacket off and just sets it over the arm of the couch and starts to kind of like untie his boots. And he's just like talking to Derek. What are you doing here, man? I'm I'm happy to see you. I gotta say. Yeah, Wayne, meet our new employee. Get out! Really? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Wayne will kind of do the friendly like arm punch. All right. Welcome to the gang, Derek. Oh, hello again, folks. I'd like to tell you about the Facebook group we run called White Wolf and Onyx Path RPGs Gameplay and Media. Have you ever wished you could have an easy way to find gameplay videos and podcasts or just media in general that deals with your favorite White Wolf role-playing games? Why have you ever wished you could find a forum to share gameplay that you have recorded? One that won't be drowned out by random posts and discussions, so that your media could get the attention you deserve. The group is specifically run with the sole intent of being a one-stop shop for people to view or share media involving the games we all love. We take thorough steps to ensure the page 
does not become cluttered and is easy to traverse. The group is already immense and continuing to rapidly grow, with new media being shared every day. Stop on by. We hope to see you there.